Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, Defending Supply Chain Attacks with Kubernetes and DevSecOps, brought to you by Contrast Security. We have a great webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for on-demand viewing. We will also be sending out a link to access the webinar on demand, or you can visit DevOps.com slash webinars. We want to hear from you today, so please feel free to send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A tab. We also encourage discussion by using the chat tab, so let us know your thoughts or just say a quick hello. Finally, stick around until the end because we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards, so stay tuned to see if you're a winner. Finally, joining me today is Mark Tomza, uh, Senior Alliance Solutions Architect, Contrast Security, and Mark uh, Kriaf. Partner Solutions Architect, AWS. And with that, I'm going to put myself on mute, turn off my camera, and let you begin. Hi, my name is Mark Tomza, and I'm here with Mark Kriak, and we'll be talking about defending against software supply chain attacks within Kubernetes. Before we get into it, just a quick agenda. Uh, basically, we're gonna go over introductions between Mark and I, uh, the objective what we're talking about, problem statement, the solution of it, how this all works together in terms of the business side and technical uh, consumption of the automation we'll be talking about, which will be uh, AWS, EKS, Contrast Security, and GitHub Actions. So we're actually going to see a demo, which I'm pretty excited about, where Mark's going to go through and he's actually going to onboard an application with Contrast onto Amazon EKS. And then following the demo, we'll have some questions. So a little bit about myself. So my name is Mark Tomza. I work on the alliances side here at Contrast Security. And I'm more the technical liaison, if that makes sense. Uh, I've been both on the vendor side and on the services side. So I've built software, sold software, incorporated software into solutioning, uh, work with SIs, pretty much everything top down. Uh, but um, the biggest thing that I've been working on for the past 10 years is helping companies move from like brick and mortar uh, software structures to more uh, revenue-based software structures. So essentially I've been taking companies that are doing the old way of things and bringing it up to the modern tech stacks in terms of digital transformations. So Mark, do you want to step in and introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks, Mark. My name is Mark Kriaf. Uh, I'm a partner solutions architect at AWS. Um, a part, as a partner solutions architect, what we do uh, is uh, we work with our AWS partners like Contrast Security to create integrations between partner products and AWS services uh, based on customer customer asks and customer requests. Awesome. Thanks again. So yeah, Mark and I are very similar in terms of not just name, but responsibilities. So, <laughs> so we'll be talking about, uh, so as I mentioned before, we'll be talking about how you secure your software supply chain. Uh, in order to do this, we're going to be incorporating security at the ground level. So we're going to be talking about this a lot, but essentially when you're looking at implementations overall, a lot of companies or a lot of projects tend to look at a more reactionary approach where problems happen and they have to kind of reach back into the implementation. What we're going to be doing is actually how do you incorporate the solutioning from the onset at the fundamental level? So things like accelerating your implementation, scaling it out and ensuring governance across all your different application streams and your uh, revenue streams in house. So it's going to be incorporating things like shared responsibility models, you know, frameworks for automation. Here we're using GitHub Actions, but you can use your own flavor. And then finally enhancing basically the Kubernetes workloads in-house. A little overview of kind of what's been happening in the marketplace. Uh, so as you all know, there have been breaches, hacks as of late, things affecting us in the real world now, where people are actually going through and maliciously attacking software supply chains that affect systems that in our day-to-day -day lives affect us. And a prime example of this is the uh, oil pipelines that were shut down for by Russian hackers. And Mark, you're down your head, so dead on with that. But uh, <laughs> uh, more or less, we're gonna be talking about how to secure your supply chain to prevent things like that. So with the executive order that the Biden administration passed, they're giving companies a way to create a baseline for their software implementations via supply chain. So as an example, they're going through and actually giving them the nuts and bolts of how to incorporate this stuff at a ground level, right? And Mark, maybe you wanna cut into the uh, supply chain attacks with a high level. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, I think we, we see it uh, more and more today. Um, 
And I think customers are now realizing it's uh, not only important to uh, secure your application from external access, but it's also very important to make sure that when we build the application, when we, uh, when we, before we deploy it, when we test it, every single part is also secure. Um, and this is where contrast security comes in. Exactly. And a couple other symptoms of the issues that we're facing. So as you all know, the world's evolving. It's not getting slower, it's getting faster, and there are more pieces to keep track of. So because of that, security compliance and governance is becoming more and more mainstream. They're being enforced across teams within the enterprise. The big thing here is if you're making money off software, there's gonna be some sort of compliance that you're gonna be facing in order to make sure that what's coming in is coming out, if that makes sense, in terms of things like building materials, artifacts, ensuring that your customer is safe and your application is very trustworthy as well. Uh, in terms of cybersecurity and supply chain attacks, they're becoming more and more mainstream, as I mentioned. Uh, you want to be protecting not only the container, but the application inside the container. We're going to touch upon that as well, just because you're going to have access to the app and it doesn't actually matter where it runs. You want to make sure that you're hardened inside out, right? And as we mentioned, software security has kind of been an afterthought. We want to start incorporating that at the ground level by doing things like shifting left, talking about how platform teams are creating automation solutions that actually templatize this automation and make it super consumable by development and application teams. And the last but not least is limiting the noise. A lot of times when you hear people actually moving towards encompassing more security into their implementations, they're looking at thousands of CVEs and things like that when they're onboarding these apps. We're gonna show you how to actually create feedback loops to limit the noise. So our big problem statement here that we're gonna address is how do we actually protect our software supply chain? And the answer here is through implementation and making sure that you're organization is ready to consume the instrumentation via automation. So how do we all do this? I kind of lightly touched upon this, but you have to make sure that your organization is ready to consume this automation that we're gonna be going over. Things like cross-functional product teams, DevOps, cloud native frameworks, all these things fit together that let your organization actually go through and consume things that the platform team, for example, works on in terms of automations like pipelines and workflows, right? We're gonna be giving an example of GitHub Actions workflows, but more or less you could use things like Jenkins as well, need be. You could use your own flavor, but from a high level, the methodologies are the exact same. We're gonna be talking about automating the software life cycles. And I touched upon the consumption and scale, but just to kind of give you an idea, there are things out there which companies follow in terms of frameworks like DevOps, servicing, ITIL, that kind of take all this knowledge and these methodologies and make it consumable for the enterprise in-house. So as an example, you want to make sure that you're using cross-functional product teams in terms of alignment and how those teams work in-house and in getting software out the door is enhanced through the automation. The automation does not necessarily drive the business processes it piggybacks off the business processes. Does that make sense? And last but not least, security is value carried down to the customer. And Mark, maybe you want to touch upon that too. Yeah, um, I think um, when we talk about migration and modernization um, of uh, applications uh, today that we use today or cloud of cloud native application, um, security is always something that we need to uh, we need to start thinking of from the beginning, uh, since we write our code, when we write our code, when we try to test it for the first time, we need to account for all the security, uh, all the security parts, you know, whether it's uh, penetration testing and uh, things like making sure that we're not using frameworks or packages in our code that are vulnerable or have open vulnerabilities to uh, what kind of uh, operating systems we're using. Uh, if we're running Docker, so if we're running it directly on virtual machines or and things like that. Yep. Thank you for that. That was exactly what I was looking for. From a high level, when you look at things like application security and then supply chains and kind of seeing how they both fit together, you want to look at Mark kind of touched upon this. You want to look at things like build materials, right? Like what are you writing, right? The dependencies that are happening. What are you building with the tools that are associated with it? the SaaS environments that you're deploying to, right? Any third party integrations that you're encompassing into your supply chain, you want to make sure those are covered, not just in functionality, but also in data integrations as well. And you're making decisions off those data points. So if things do turn ugly, 
in terms of some things in production. I mean, we've all done software for a very long time and we've all had instances where something breaks in prod. You wanna be able to point to that data artifact to make sure that you're covered from a compliance and audit perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah, and 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 this is a this is a very great example. This is a very good example. Uh, this specific slide um, for just how much effect uh, securing the application has on our uh, you know supply chain or uh, on on our day to day work lives. Uh, you know things like uh, uh, releasing multiple times a day and making sure or multiple times a week uh, and making sure that we meet our deadlines, meet, meeting our SLDCs, SDLCs, um, things like that. Um, but just, uh, you know, we switched with in, in the last year, year and a half, we did the switch from working from home and we, we, we introduced so many new attack vectors um, into our, uh, into our work, uh, work area or work, uh, um, uh, work environment. So we need to make sure that we are covering all our bases also there. I couldn't have said it better myself. And just to piggyback on that, you want to make sure that not only is your software and your tools where your software are actually covered in terms of the security and compliance aspect for the supply chain, but the cloud itself, the aspect of working in distributed environment is much different than working in-house in a, a very, very small data center. So that's something to keep in mind as we move forward. And what you see on the screen here is a basic example of a software supply chain. Might look familiar, it should. It's basically how things work together in terms like a pipeline. So I mentioned Jenkins, GitHub Actions, you have AWS uh, CDK, tools like that basically integrate all your different business functionality to get software out the door, AKA your, uh, how do I say this? Your software factory, right? This is almost like your assembly line. So here an application goes to different environments through different gates, right? You don't necessarily have to have manual gates, but you would want to have some sort of gating and some sort of business logic that the gates are based off of preventing any type of malicious activity, actually exploits or vulnerabilities that enable malicious activity to get into those environments. And Mark, do you want to add two cents before I get next slide? Yeah, um, so I think uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very good depiction of uh, what, we, what, we want to, what we want to achieve here. We need to keep in mind that we have a very, usually a very complex supply, uh, a pipeline, which uh, was testing, was regression tests um, and all kinds of different deployments where the Lambda, Fargate, EKS directly into on-prem, all kinds of uh, combinations that we're using today. Um, and it's very important to make sure that uh, between those parts, we are uh, making sure that we're not introducing a uh, security risk. Exactly. And if you keep this in mind, so keep this snapshot in mind because the next slide puts this into the big picture. So here is a graphic representation of how delivery teams actually deliver software via automation consumption. So here you can see application teams one, two, and three, right? These are cross-functional teams optimally. They have an application owner, they could be a product owner, but essentially this person goes through and creates work for the rest of the team in terms of enabling the other teammates the business logic needed for the enhancements. So work items as an example. They work with the different business owners, the different stakeholders to get the enhancements in-house, right? And the rest of the team go through and create those enhancements. Here you can see QA team, dev team, security team. They have different roles, but essentially their job is to get software out the door in terms of getting those enhancements completed via work items, right? Stories, there are different words for them, different types of objects, but essentially work comes in, work comes out. And the big thing here is the platform team creates the automation in terms of pipelines, right? And make it almost like a self-service model where application teams come in and consume this automation via like a commit or something like that. Here again, we're using GitHub Actions where you can any, use any type of workflow technology you'd like, right? So dev is onboarded, dev works with a security person or a QA person for with an enhancements, right? With, that work with the application owner, goes, does a commit, consumes the, the actual, the integrations via the pipeline that the platform team creates. Does that make sense? And the big thing here is you wanna treat it all as a product because you're treating the pipeline as a product. You can go through and create those value streams that we're talking about on the previous slide, right? To get security encompassed in those as well. And that's what we mean by actually solidifying the uh, software supply chain and hardening it along the way.
And then at a higher level, what this happens in terms of the integration points is the platform team take all these little pieces that they need in order to actually get software out the door. So if you look at so every application has a build, a test, a deploy, and they have different gating mechanisms, correct? So what this actually represents are the different pieces to get that stuff out the door, right? And what happens is in order to scale, they create APIs that represents those integration points and they're then ingested into the pipeline itself. So almost like glue that's consumed by the application uh, teams themselves. So as an application owner, I go through, have my dev do the work, the dev commits, they consume that pipeline with all these different integration points. And then your application goes through all those separate business processes, right? To ensure that your application is not only solidified, but it's preventing against future attacks. You want to comment on this before I move on? Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't have any uh, anything to add here. It's uh, yeah, it's a very good high level description of uh, what exactly goes on. And this brings it all together. So we talked about the glue. We talked about the different integration points to get software out the door. And we talked about how the, the product teams actually work together to solidify it, right? The methodology is the cross-functional product teams in terms of consumption of this automation. What this represents is actually templatizing those workflows and those abstractions based on those application teams. So what I've done in previous lives is actually helped companies with their digital transformations by accomplishing this, by basically an overarching business process, like a workflow or pipeline that covers the entire SDLC in terms of business process, and then using the different abstractions in terms of parameters to actually let the application teams do what they need as long as they meet certain KPIs. So as an example, I can use this for a uh, web logic application, a microservice application, a serverless app, whatever, it's still hitting the same business logic is what we're trying to say. So from a management perspective, you don't have everything as a snowflake. You, everything has its own semantics in terms of what they do for deployment, right? Or test, but they're still meeting those business requirements. And that's what we mean by solidifying the actual uh, supply chain for applications and in-house as you scale. You wanna make sure that from a uh, solidity standpoint, right? Everything is following the same type of business process. So you can control it, you can monitor it, and you can enhance it in the same way. So this basically comes out like a cookie cutter where you can go through and since you're encompassing security at the ground level, you can go and one change here, right? At point A is reflected also in point B when you're scaling, which is super powerful because you're not doing what we're currently doing in today's day and age of going back into implementation from the outside in and trying to rewrite things when there are a whole bunch of different moving parts. You want to comment on that, Mark? Yeah, no, I totally agree. It gives us a, a better perspective of how to, uh, how to introduce different changes in our, uh, in our pipeline. And just to kind of put it all together, uh, I kind of went over the high level overview of the consumption model that an application team would follow through an enterprise, right? So the application consumes automation from a platform team that works with the different integration points within the enterprise, AKA departments, right? To get software out the door. You create templates so these business workflows, make them consumable for the application teams themselves, harden them as needed with feedback loops. So we haven't touched upon it just yet, but the way you do this is with the software lifecycle, when, whenever you have like a, a new enhancement come in, you then work with the product owner. So the security person would actually go through and facilitate meetings with the product owner to go through and determine what was important in terms of uh, prioritization, right? In order to get things done. And then you hand it off to your development team to actually go and make those enhancements. That's how it all fits into play. If you look at the actual overarching message here, once you're ready to consume the automation, that's when you can go through and use your integrations like with GitHub Actions, whatnot, or with AKS and contrast or EKS and contrast security to go through and harden it from a technical perspective. As long as you have those business processes down, take the automation, templatize it, scale it, and then iterate. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. 
All right. So now I'm going to hand it off to Mark. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, let me start by sharing my screen and we'll go over um, what we're going to talk about uh, in our uh, in our demo. So uh, I'll stop. Sharing. Can you swap to? Yeah. Uh, can you just swap to the next slide? I think we had a we have a short, uh, short uh, background. So what we what we want to achieve here in this demo or what we're trying to what we are uh, going to show is how we take several uh, several inputs that we usually give to our uh, to our applications that things like environment variables etc uh, we build a docker application in our case it will be a web application we commit it into an ecr repo we deploy it into a eks uh, server and then we involve, and then we show how we contrast security comes in and gives us a in-depth view of what exactly is going on and how secure is our application uh, in our in you know in in our case our web application. So um, I'll quickly share my screen. Yep, I'll stop sharing real quick. It's all yours. Thank you. You so um, yeah so what we see here uh, and we'll share everything with uh, with all the attendees when we uh, after the after the webinar uh, we have a very simple uh, very simple GitHub GitHub repo for our demo uh, we have two main parts in our um, in our in our uh, GitHub repo the first main part the first part is our uh, our web application so in our case we are using a Docker, uh, we're using uh, building a Docker with Spring in it for our uh, web application. Um, the other uh, the other part here that is our workflow for GitHub Actions. Um, we're taking several um, several inputs uh, and setting them as uh, environment variables. And essentially, what we're doing is building, as I said, building our our Docker, pushing it to ECR, and deploying it into uh, injecting. Sorry. Uh, de deploy, uh, pushing it into ECR and adding the um, contrast security component into our Docker to help us uh, instrument uh, instrument our application. And then we're pushing it into EKS uh, and deploying it uh, to the outside world. Um, as a prerequisites um, for people who, wants to, who want to test it, as I mentioned, we'll have the full instruction, uh, but I already have a set up um, an ECR repository. Uh, and also an EKS cluster um, with uh, a load balancer in front of it. Um, the, to actually trigger, so every time we, pu we do a push, uh, we do a push to our, uh, to our repository, we'll see our workflow running. Um, and let's do a quick rerun of the last image, of the last uh, run. And here we see here we'll, we'll see in a couple of seconds we'll see all this all the steps the build step the, the uh, injecting of the instrumentation part the pushing the, the pushing into um, into ECR and then deployment of course and what our workflows again we can reuse we're in this example we're using uh, GitHub Actions this can apply to any other CI/CD or any other pipeline you can use. Uh, whether it's Jenkins, Code Pipeline, Circle CI, whatever you're using, uh, but the concepts are still the concept is the main the main the main part here. Uh, the part where we add our instrumentation into our application in order to get uh, to get more visibility from a security perspective. So we'll give it a couple of seconds and just, uh, we're building our little application here. In our example, we're using a Docker application, as I mentioned, uh, with Spring, based on Spring uh, framework. Um, and yeah. It takes a second or two to do a little yeah. automation, but <laughs> it's worth yeah, it. Yeah, there's a lot of smaller moving parts here, and that's uh, that what we want. What we want to show, we automated the main. The important thing here is the automation. We want to give our uh, developers, our DevOps teams, the ease of mind or ease of use here. 
we're not going to send people to push multiple buttons all over, you know, in multiple contexts. Um, what we want to achieve here is simplicity. We want to have one automation to do everything we need from start to end. And now, of course, we're skipping here a large part of uh, testing, which is also a very important uh, part when we to, we're, we're talking about uh, a production grade or production ready um, uh, deployment for an application. So testing, whether it's aggression testing, whether it's uh, testing in general, it's a, it's a very important part. And because we're uh, because we're talking about like blocks, like we're using building blocks here, it's very easy to add and remove steps as we need. So let's uh, I'll quickly go over what we what happened here. So we, as I mentioned, the application was built. The application was built. Uh, the application was deployed into EKS. Um, and essentially, we at the end we get a, an endpoint, which is our um, uh, load balancer, and we have our website. And I will hand off to uh, Mark, who will show us the contrast security part of uh, what we did here, uh, the instrumentation, and how we can understand um, what are the security vulnerabilities that we, we are introducing with each, each time we deploy or where do we need to uh, put some more emphasis on when, uh, on when, to, uh, uh, when to edit or remove some, some frameworks. Thanks again, Mark. So what I'll do is I'll bring up my screen really quick. So what I'm doing is I'm logging into the contract security uh, team server, which is technically your portal. And here we have an example application, right? We are using the pet clinic application. So as Mark mentioned, this is a Spring Boot application. It's been Dockerized, it has a Docker build. We passed the Kubernetes manifest as one of the inputs. Uh, so essentially with the automation that took place, we built the Docker image, we stored it into the ECR registry, we deployed it onto EKS, right? And then we configured environment variables on the Kubernetes side to pass in the communication configurations with contrast. So this is the output, which is really awesome because what you can do here is actually start incorporating the entire application security aspect of things into your workflows, right? Without actually having to go change your workflows. That's the biggest thing we wanna communicate with using automation like the GitHub Action we just showed. There's nothing outside the developer workflow that developer has to actually do in order to use and get the benefit of this tool, right? Other than the communication of the tokens used to communicate with contrast in terms of configuration, nothing in terms of setup was used that the developer would not have to go and actually go set up themselves. Does that make sense? So you're getting the value. Yeah, and go ahead. One sorry. thing before we continue, sorry, uh, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, what we, um, when we are running, when we added contrast here, we added it as an ad hoc addition. So meaning um, we, we can see the vulnerabilities, but uh, what about acting about uh, upon them? So uh, in a more advanced setup, I want to say, uh, we can have like stops or manual authorization uh, steps that we can add to our pipeline, leveraging the information we get from contrast security about the vulnerabilities that we was, were found in our uh, application. And that's exactly what we talk about in terms of using that telemetry, those data feeds to actually make decisions off those data points, right? to where you wanna go through and you wanna automate as much as you can. Like understandably so there's limitations on it with certain types of enterprises, right? A lot of compliance-based enterprises, things where there are a lot of checks and balances still that have to have human intervention. It might be you know, really hard to go through and do that, but you wanna get as automated as possible where you're going through and making decisions off those data points as Mark was mentioning. Like, and the big thing here is once you have this actually working, it literally just works by itself to where the sensors on contrast side are monitoring all the vulnerabilities with your application. So as actionable items, what can happen is you can set up gates and you can set up criteria. And I'll show you that as well with the integrations on contrast side, where if I have an incoming exploit or something in terms of vulnerability come in, if it's severe enough, I can automatically create like a work item where a developer, a security person, and the app owner will get together and actually go through and determine how to actually enhance the application to make sure that's taken care of. Does that make sense? 
All right, so we have the screen here. It's our basic application with uh, Pet Clinic. And this is again, deployed on EKS. And as a brief overview, so you have a bunch of functionality, a bunch of value provided by contrast, where you don't have to actually be a security expert to incorporate security into your solutioning and your value streams. And what I mean by that is, this is meant for people who want to do security now, today, at this very moment, even if you're not up to speed with all the different CVEs, all the different frameworks, and all the other knowledge you need in order to actually go through and start being, you know, secure, security oriented. The top left, you see a custom code score, a library score, overall score, and a protect score. What this does is gives you a picture of how well you're doing in terms of stature of your current implementation of security. Here it's an F, which is not the greatest, but you work your way up, right? And next to here, you can see libraries, routes, and server, and I'll be touching upon these one by one, uh, but more or less you wanna go through, and this is an entire software security platform, an application security platform. It encompasses the OSS product, SCA, so basically your source code analysis, to assess, which is your vulnerabilities, and then finally protect, which protect takes your exploits, right? And actually protects your IP from ever being hit from the outside. And we'll touch upon that as well. So as I mentioned, we have vulnerabilities here, nothing too major, but as you can see, we have different types of classifications associated with it. So if I click into another application, I can see critical vulnerabilities, medium vulnerabilities, a whole bunch of different useful information that we have, right? That we can use to not only classify, but prioritize work. So if I click into it, I get a whole bunch of useful information on the vulnerability itself. Not only is it critical, but it gives me a picture of what's happening behind the scenes all the way down to the code base. So if I click on details and I click further down, I get a stack trace of the actual exception that happened, which is awesome because it's actually helped developers actually not only pinpoint the root cause, but we help developers actually go through and tell them how to fix it from a code base. And this is what we mean by providing value without having no security day one, right? So this is an example of a SQL injection, but this goes across the board for any type of uh, vulnerability associated with the contrast product, where you can go through, look at what needs to be done from a coding perspective and incorporate this into your favorite ID. Does that make sense? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my application right here. We don't have any attacks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step through the libraries associated. So the cool thing here is this, from a bill of materials perspective, we are talking about software supply chain, right? You wanna know what dependencies are associated with your libraries. So as an example, here you have Bootstrap 3.3.6. If I click into it, it gives me the vulnerabilities associated with that actual library, right? That jar file. What applications are using it? And here, no classes are instantiated, so you're okay. But it gives you all the information you need to actually start incorporating this within your workflow. So as an example, I can look at my library stats and I can see the known vulnerabilities, the vulnerabilities associated, the stale vulnerabilities, everything you need to actually limit noise. Does that make sense? So I actually go through and I can target what I wanna look at based on usage. So the way contrast works is through instrumentation. And that being said, when I'm going through and I'm creating my tests, right? And I'm clicking through the app itself, it's recording all the vulnerabilities and passing it to the platform. So it gives me a view of what's happening and how it's happening in real time. So not only does it give you a great security stature, but also helps you write better tests. So it actually gives you the value of encompassing the new feature sets throughout your entire life cycle. Does that make sense? So it's not just the development piece, it's all the different pieces within the software supply chain. You wanna comment on that, Mark? 
Yeah, um, I think the the fact that we have this very nice UI and all these statistics and everything written in a in a non you know I, I don't need as you mentioned I don't need to be a security expert to understand how to how I can uh, not only make my application more secure but it also uh, introduces me to things that me as a developer as an operations person might not be aware of, like open CVEs or uh, you know all kind of all kind of things like that um and this 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 is this is this is what i like about this product specifically yep and thanks for that so what i did while mark was talking is i stepped through another aspect the contrast so we actually monitor the activity on the uh, platform itself meaning when you're going through and you're hitting those urls we record those urls so we monitor things like queries http calls the vulnerabilities associated with it we have things like route coverage, which is extremely important. This is actually almost like a roadmap inside your application that shows what's available. So here you want to actually go through and you can see, you know, I hit this 37 seconds ago, this controller, but essentially, and these are the right URLs associated with that call. You want to get in the security posture and the actual, uh, the regimen of going through and making sure that all your routes are covered within your app, because if they are, then you can ensure that your customers are secure because there are no, how do I want to say this, backdoors or extra extraneous things associated with your routes, right? So as an example, if I have a couple routes that have some vulnerabilities associated with them, I want to take care of that. I don't want to leave those outstanding to where all of a sudden I have someone malicious come in and exploit that, right? Because once you look at security from the posture of the application side, you want to make sure that everything is covered on the app side. The big thing that I want to communicate here is just because you're covered from like a container perspective, it doesn't limit malicious activity on the application because you still have access to the application is what I'm trying to say, right? So because you have access to the application and you have those routes associated with that malicious activity or those vulnerabilities, right? The possibility of those being malicious attacks grows greatly, right? The surface area grows greatly. What you want to do is limit surface area in terms of security. And this is how you branch it out into your supply chain as well. Here we have a flow map and what the flow map is almost like a topography of the architecture within the application. It's nice. It sure gives you a little, the backend systems, the connected applications, the actual architecture itself. And then finally we have policy management. So the way all this works is these are almost like rule sets where you go through and from assess Assess gives you the vulnerabilities from the application, as you mentioned, right? So once I start going through and I start clicking through the app, it gives me the actual vulnerabilities that can be exploited. What Protect does, Protect actually goes through and as an attack is happening, right? It will go through and cut off availability to that specific interface. So as an example, what we normally show for a demo is we have like an input, like a text input, and that has a SQL injection vulnerability. What we do is we turn on protect, we type in SQL injection here, and we go from monitor to block. And what this does, it actually prevents IP from being lost and the exploit from ever happening. So if you're in production, right, and you couldn't catch a vulnerability up to that point, what you do is if you see an attack or if you realize, wow, this is a vulnerability that I didn't get a chance to actually attend to, I can go in here and with no code change whatsoever, put it on block within my environment and it won't actually instantiate that input. It'll bubble up the exception. Does that make sense? So when I go to the landing page itself, so if I go to the, the pet clinic application and I go through and I click it into like, uh, let's say an input that has a vulnerability associated with it, I won't even be able to get into the page. It will just bubble up an exception that says, okay, this has this exploit, you are not able to see it, which is much better than actually going through and having your IP lost. Does that make sense? That's the value that's provided by these products. So OSS goes through and gives you that bill of materials from an open source perspective, right? Those nested bill of materials, those dependencies, the stuff associated with your code base, assess goes in and it notifies you of potential vulnerabilities associated with CVEs, right? And then from an attack perspective, protect steps in 
And in your production environment, you can go through and actually block any type of malicious attacks on your IP without losing anything, which is super powerful. So you're covered from all the bases. You're covered from development on through to production, and you have all that telemetry fed into the product itself. So if I click into the integrations, I know I mentioned the feedback loops. This is how it goes back to the feedback loops. If I go on the integration side, we work with different tool sets to basically take those different data points via telemetry and feed it into actionable items, right? So if there's something coming in, something being exploited or a new vulnerability that comes in via test, I can have a Slack message, right? Or a Microsoft Teams message pop up and notify me. I could even go as far as having a JIRA created for, let's say, a critical measure. So I, you remember how I showed the, the little critical CVE in the demo earlier? Normally, what you would have is you'd have a criteria set up on your JIRA integration that says, if this is critical, automatically create a ticket and get the people together because it's severe enough to where you want to take care of it ASAP. That's what we mean about the feedback loops and actually making this consumable within the enterprise. If you have the business processes ready for consumption, all you do with the automation is basically templatize and scale. And that's how you do it. Does that make sense? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. So we've gone over the software supply chain, how to harden a software supply chain, and we do this through instrumentation. But the big key here that we're communicating is in order to instrument and automate, you have to be ready to consume an organizational layer, right? Cross-functional product-based teams, DevOps, cloud native uh, organizations, they're, the reason they're able to move so fast is because they're ready for the consumption of the automation. If you look at the methodologies involved, right? You're working with product owners and security people to make sure your developer is committing code that's affecting their value streams. That's the big thing in terms of feedback. And so our call to action to you is to take a look at not only contrast, but Amazon EKS, it's a great product, Take a look at the marketplace and GitHub Actions. Do a little search on contrast. What you can do is actually download Community Edition. So what you do is you go into this link here and you click in the Community Edition. You register really quick and enter in those details in the inputs that Mark showed you and you're off and running in no time. So essentially, you don't have to be a security expert to be doing security day one. This gives you the means to do so. Mark, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and uh, just as I mentioned, um, we are going to publish the GitHub repo that I uh, that I demoed uh, alongside with some some more instructions on how to uh, to get the POC ready. Um, and uh, yeah, you can this this is something you can do with any other pipeline, any other uh, deployment method. Um, the most important part here is to introduce this uh, automated part uh, into your pipeline, essentially. And I want to take a second and thank Mark and the AWS team for working with me on the GitHub Action. You guys are awesome. And I very I recommend using this stuff. It, we made it very, very easy to use. Like I said, you don't have to be a security expert to be doing security. That's the big thing. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Mark, for having me uh, today here. Um, really exciting topic. Yeah, really exciting topic. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward for our next uh, session. And that's it, everyone. Thanks again. And we'll have some Thank questions. You. Bye. Today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the webinar, you will be able to watch it again. We will be sending out an email with a link to access webinar on demand. And you can also find it on DevOps.com. Just look in the on demand section in the webinars page, and it should be there. Uh, I'm not going to announce the winners of the four $25 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner is Joshua S. Congratulations, Joshua. Our second winner is Christian S. Our third winner is Scott B. And our final winner is Tom H. So congratulations to all our winners. We'll be reaching out to you via email with instructions for claiming your Amazon gift card. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see it there, check your spam folder. 
Uh, Mark and Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to put this presentation together and uh, for you know the hour of your time. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for their time and engagement. Uh, this is Julio Godinez signing off until next time. Thanks, everyone.